Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jerry Guiones. I'm Melissa Guiones, and we are photographers that are based right here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And we are also based in Melbourne, Australia, which is where Jerry is from originally. We're both photographers. I've been photographing for over 16 years, and Jerry's been photographing for over 25 years. And Jerry's also a very proud Nikon ambassador as well. Guys, I started my professional career at the age, age of 20. Now, most people, I guess most young guys especially, when you want to start in photography, you just want to shoot pretty girls, like pretty much everybody else. But I realized that actually wedding photography was going to be the best testing ground to actually learn my craft. Because after all, when you're shooting a wedding, you're shooting multiple genres. You take the veil off, you're shooting a portrait. Take your clothes off, it's bald, it's newborn. They grow up, it's children <laughs> photography. And not only that, you do it with time constraints, weather constraints, and that's what it's all about. So I had a great time. I soon loved the idea of making people look and feel beautiful. Being able to actually get to bring out the best in the bride with a simple tilt of a head, with a simple pose, and beautiful light, it can make all the difference. Maybe you might come across this way so these guys can see what's going on. <laughs> and also, I began really understanding the idea of creating at least one spectacular image on every single wedding. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the idea of bread and butter storytelling images, but there's nothing like an iconic image like this with so much symbolism, as you can see, to bring out the best in that couple and give them something to put on the wall. Because after all, we are photographers, and I don't believe it's a real photograph until it's printed. Now, even though that I made people look and feel beautiful, I began to, and as you get older, it comes with maturity, I love the idea of immortalizing relationships. And being able to capture and create moments like this is amazing. Now, did this just happen on its own, or did I prompt it? Well, here's what happened. You've heard of a bride and groom doing a reveal, being able to see each other before they get married. This shot was created by getting the, the bride and her dad back to back so they can feel each other's energy. And I can say some simple words like, are you ready to see your father for the last time as a single girl? Now, either that it turns to tears or turns into laughter, and these guys turned around and gave us an incredible image. Now, last year, I felt a little bit of burnout. I was photographing for 24 years straight, and I felt I wanted to get back to my roots because part of my roots was actually doing a lot of fashion photography. So I spent two months totally just shooting for myself and really enjoying the idea of being able to create just for the love of it. Because after all, photography, really, we're historians, we're storytellers. Can you imagine the world without nothing shot through the lens of a camera? That's no movies, no magazines, no TV, nothing at all. It would be a very boring place. Also created this shot, which was fun because you have to design the image in your head and create it as it's coming up. Now, last year, as one of Nikon's ambassadors, I was actually asked to photograph the campaign for the Nikon D850 camera. If you don't know about the Nikon D850, where have you been? It's simply one of the best cameras ever made. And quite simply, we did the whole campaign. The resolution's incredible, but can you imagine having the power of a medium format camera with the tangibility of a DSLR? And last year, my wife turned 30 plus 10, <laughs> an age that's unspeakable. But I ended up photographing Melissa for her 40th birthday. I thought, what else, what else would you give someone if you're in love with them and you're a photographer but creating a beautiful portrait like this. Now, we're talking today about the power of photography and actually changing the world and making a difference. And I think many of us feel like it's overwhelming that we can't do everything for everyone, so why we even start? My suggestion is just start somewhere. Now, here's what I did. I was feeling very blessed in my career, and I decided to put a call out on Facebook, and I said, if I can grant you one wish, what would it be? Not knowing unbeknownst to my audience and my followers, that I was going to grant some of those wishes. It, and and it, it created actually, a great story. It was pretty cool, the story itself. People just thought it was a uh, hypothetical question. So, oh, you know, I would love to have a million dollars, or I would love this. And, but then we started reading some comments where there were some beautiful stories that were coming out, where people were really needing something. And it was heartbreaking to read. And we read one comment by this beautiful woman named Beverly. And she said, I've been married to my soulmate for 30 years, but we don't have any wedding photos of ourselves because when we got married, so if I could have any wish come true, it would be that I would get married all over again, but with the same man, 
and have you photograph the wedding so I could have wedding photos. And this, her story went on. She had gone through a lot of health issues. Her husband had gone through a lot of health issues, but they both survived. And now here they were together. And she just said, I just would love to be able to celebrate that. So basically, we replied and said, you're married, renew your vows, wherever it is, it's time that we really understood, it doesn't have to be something on a massively grand scale. The idea about doing something good for someone else is to just find what you're passionate about. What is it that you love? Is it animals? For us, it's photography. We love photography. So how can we use that? No matter what your passion is, there's someone that could use that. So use your passion, and that's an easy way to give back to the community to help Beverly and George. We flew out and we photographed their vow renewal, and it was absolutely amazing because it was she and her husband, their three children, their grandchildren, their children and grandchildren were all part of the wedding party, and it was just so beautiful. I felt sometimes like it was more of a gift to us no doubt. than it was to them. It was pretty amazing. No doubt. And there was a moment at the wedding actually where we did a reveal of the bride and the groom. Can you imagine getting a second chance to fall in love all over again? This moment that I'm about to show you is where the groom, for the second time, was around the corner, and then Beverly looked at me with these eyes, and that was all the thanks that I needed. And what I'm encouraging for, for you in the audience right here and for those of you at home, like I said, start small. Don't be overwhelmed by being able to make a difference. And that's just it, guys. The fact is that when you want to be a photographer, you want to be a professional at anything, simply you just want to make it. You want to make it. Then you need to master. And I strongly encourage that in a world that's full of shortcuts, this iPhone or the device that you have in your pocket is treated us like we need to get everything now. And if we can't get everything now, it's not even worth it. But the fact is, I want to master. And that's the great thing about photography. You will never completely master it, and that's the fun of it. Focus on the process, not the result. And quite simply, after you've been doing it for a while, like we have, you want to matter. And that's the whole idea. And I want to tell you about a life-changing trip that I took actually in Cambodia. Cambodia is a beautiful place, and, and I was actually inspired by the movie Tomb Raider, as I'm sure most of you were, and you saw these incredible temples. And I was there for 10 days. We had a tour guide basically taking us to all these temples. And after a while, I actually began to see Third World with my own two eyes. Now, we've all seen Third World. Most of us have seen Third World on the way from an airport to a five-star resort on the coast, and that's your exposure to a Third World. But being able to see a whole family on a bike, for example, <coughs> um, children on a boat, and but just the simple, pure joy that people have with next to nothing is quite inspiring as it is quite, I guess, upsetting in certain ways. But if you don't know any better, you just make the most out of life. Now, here's what happened to me. I actually said to my tour guide, I, I said, you know what, I, I'm, I, I want to go to this temple and I want to do something for the locals. And then what happened was that all these kids started running around trying to sell me something or get money from me. And I thought, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a dollar per child and I'll photograph you. Word got around and I was surrounded by hundreds of children in a car park at one point. It was overwhelming and I almost had to be nasty just to fend them off. That very moment, I walked away, I'm like, well, fine. You don't want help from me, that's it. Like, I was so righteous that I was going to give a dollar per child. As I walked up this pathway, I saw this, um, this little child on the side. She wasn't begging, she was just sitting there, but I saw the back of her head. As I started walking down the path, and as you do, you sort of look at the person acknowledgingly, a disfigured face I had ever seen. I, and and I've, I believe that what, what the tour guide told me was that she had acid poured over her, and it was just heartbreaking. I, I didn't know where her eyes were, where... It was heartbreaking, to say the least. So then I turned around after I looked at her and I started weeping uncontrollably. My tears were sort of blending into my sweat, but I had glasses, so no one was actually realized that I was crying. I, I grabbed my wallet, I took out $20, I walked up to her and I gave it to her. She didn't say anything, because I don't think she could even speak to me, let alone um, I don't know her native tongue. Then I turned around and I wept some more. I turned around again, she had her hand on her heart, and then she waved the $20 bill like this, her way of saying thank you. I turned around and I tell you what, more tears flowed. Then tour guy, the van, feeling like I've done something really different for a human being, I'm like, Jerry, you're amazing. 
you gave $20 for this little girl, she can buy a sack of rice for a month and she can live off it. I'm amazing. And then I felt like absolute dirt because I went back to my five-star resort with my fruit platter waiting for me, slept in my beautiful bed, and I said, something's wrong here. Then I said, what do the orphans need? Let's fill up the van literally to the brim with whatever we can actually fit inside it. We got sacks of rice, we got paper, we got pencils. I was greeted by like 30 of the most beautiful children I've ever met in my life. Now, we don't have children. And to be honest, there may be a reason why, because we are in a better position. Because if I had kids, perhaps that'd be my priority, right? Because we don't have kids, well, I can have kids all over the world. And it was that moment where I had an epiphany that I want to start a charity. So I went back and Melissa, we weren't married at the time and she was a paralegal and I said, how do I start a charity? How do I do it? So Jerry told me about this story and I, he called me up and he was so emotional about it. And I said, I'd love to help, like in any way I can, let's do something. And he said, I just want to be able to, I can do things locally, I can do things in my city, in my town, but I can't help these poor kids that are in another country where no one is helping them. So we decided to set up a charity so that we would always have one degree of separation between any changes that we were helping to make and the people that were receiving the, that help. We wanted to know that that's where our money and everyone, everyone's money was going. So we set up a charity called the Soul Society, and that's how it all started. And we've had a few projects um, over the years that we've done, and it's really been an amazing experience because a lot of photographers have actually helped us. When I say that we've done projects, and when I talk about some of the projects now, when I say that we helped this community, it's actually not we at all. Like, we were just the conduit. It is really thousands and thousands of photographers and people around the world who have donated to the Soul Society to help make all of this happen. And it's really amazing that the power of photography and what we're able to do, we're able to make the world such a smaller place. Most recently, we actually helped a small community in Kora, Ethiopia. Um, there, what we found is that we can go into a country and, and help a country because our charity is to specifically help poor, orphaned, and homeless children in third world countries. We figured we can go right there and find out what they need and help them. Or sometimes it's also a good idea to team up with another nonprofit organization where we can pool our resources and do some really amazing things. So, for example, in Kora, Ethiopia, another organization called Beautiful Together, who is run by Nikon ambassador Tamara Lackey. If you're here this afternoon, she's going to be speaking about this project at 4 p.m., which is really interesting. But we teamed up together. This poor community in Ethiopia actually lives on a garbage dump. They have no type of permanent shelter, as you can imagine, because garbage is always being added onto it. It's incredibly unstable. It's always shifting. There's always every landslides happening. <coughs> and this is how they make their living. They find their food. They find little bits for their shelter. They go scavenging to try to find little things to sell to try to survive. This is how they try to survive. So they had no type of modern conveniences, no housing, no kitchen, there's no, it's, this community is mostly made up of women and children, and there's no way for them to provide for themselves. So Tamara, Tamara Lackey's organization, Beautiful Together, and the Soul Society teamed up, we donated $12,000, and now this community has a full built out kitchen that was built specifically with the money that the Soul Society donated. So they have a stove, and they have a refrigerator, so they can store food products. And so now they can feed the women and children that are in their community. It's absolutely amazing. Soon after we donated that money, there was actually a massive landslide. They happen all the time in this garbage dump because they're constantly moving the garbage. But there was a really big one, so big that it actually made the news here in the US. And there were several deaths, and unfortunately, so many children died in that. So we actually diverted some of those funds to help with the relief work, to try to rescue some of the women and children that were trapped and try to provide them with another setup again. So that was something that we've been able to do in the very recent past, uh, just in the last few months. Also, previous to that, we did a big project in Nepal and we asked for a lot of photographers and, and creative people to help us out with this. There's um, a community in Nepal, it's a very poor country to begin with, but up in the mountains, there's just very little access to get there. And there's an orphanage that we, that we went to and helped out that helps these children who most of them, some of them, are not even orphans in the literal sense. 
Some of them have both of their parents, but in a country that's so poor, their parents literally cannot afford to take care of them. So it's either a case of, I'm going to keep my child, and he or she could potentially die from starvation or the elements, or I'm going to leave him at an orphanage and give him a chance to survive. That's the kind of tough decisions that some people are forced to make. So we went to this orphanage, and they basically have just two rooms. One room is where all the girls sleep, and one room is where all the boys sleep. There's no schooling, there's no access to medical floors on little mats, so it's just a really difficult situation for them. So we, they teamed up, they started building plans, they had this idea. We want to build our own community for the orphanage. We want to have a schoolhouse right in the middle where all these children can go because only when we educate these little kids can they break that cycle and can they grow up and do something with their lives. So we, they want to build a schoolhouse right in the middle and then surrounding it, little homes. And these homes are made up of three levels. Because what ends up happening is these kids stay in this orphanage, then they turn 18, 19 years old, they become an adult and they can't stay in the orphanage anymore. They're forced to go out in the world, but they don't know how to do anything. It's not their fault. So this is the way we break the cycle. We have to break that. So we built, they wanted to build this community where the older kids could be in one of the apartments with some of the younger kids, help look after them. They learn life skills, how to cook, how to clean, how to take care of themselves. And then as they get older, they are now equipped to go out into the world and, and find something to do with themselves. So we nations that we received were able to donate $77,000 to help build one of those complexes. So it's there now and the entire compound is still being built, but we've got one house built, so we're really proud of that. And that was a big, exciting thing that we did recently. Also, we just came back from South Africa early this year. Um, we went on a photo safari, and it was an absolutely amazing experience. And this is, again, one of those times when you find your passion and someone will need what you do. And while we were there on a photo safari, we went to the local, as Jerry always likes to do, we went to the local village and we found the schoolhouse and we visited with all of the little kids. And it was so funny because we brought like some supplies and toys and things like that. And then I couldn't find Jerry. And Jerry was like running around with all the kids and playing catch and he didn't even speak their language, but it was hysterical. <laughs> but it's this little tiny village in the northeast corner of South Africa, right on the Botswana border. While we were talking to the school teacher, very poor community, we found out that there were four orphans in the village who lost their parents when they were quite young. But the town is so poor that no one can adopt them and take them into their own family. So these four kids who are not related got together and are living in an abandoned building in this town. And then the rest of the village just helps when they can. The local school teacher will bring a little extra food from her family in the morning before school to help feed these kids. That's the local community helping each other. So we've pledged $10,000 to these kids because when they turn 15, they then are, have to travel to a different school. The school only goes to a certain level. And they had no way of doing that, obviously. So we've said, when you turn 15, we're going to help you find transportation, clothing, and supplies to get you there so that they also can grow up, get an education, and break that cycle. So it's about helping them to not just always give things, but finding a way where they, somebody can get out of the hole that has been created for them. We, um, we also went to India, our, one of our other trips that we just took recently also. And it was fun because while we were there, it was amazing. If, any of you have a chance to go, please go. We got to see the Taj Mahal, and even Jerry got to photograph me in front of the Taj Mahal, um, which was pretty amazing. And it was just the colors and the, the food and the music, and it was just so vibrant. It was such an amazing country. And there was so much poverty. We would be driving along, and all of a sudden, we would see an entire family of like seven or eight people, from a grandmother down to a little baby, on the sidewalk in this little tarp that's all they had, covering them, little tarp covering them, and they were cooking on the sidewalk, this little five-foot area, and it was heartbreaking. It was so heartbreaking. And everywhere we went, we would see, we would stopped at a stop sign at one point, and we saw this entire family just living on one of the ballasts of a bridge, underneath a bridge, and they were all just sitting there and all together, and it was heartbreaking. And then as we were seeing them, they all started laughing, and like they were pushing each other around and, and having, and I was, I was shocked because I felt so horrible for them 
And yet at the same time, they were together, they were a family, and they were laughing and, and still enjoying life, finding something to laugh about, where I'm thinking to myself, I would be so miserable, I, I would be suffering so much. And that's when it hit me. The human spirit is so resilient. No matter what you're going through, if there's one small bright point, then the human spirit will just grab onto that and give you something to go forward with. How many times stories have we heard of people that have been down and out and someone just helps them out and it's just what they needed to just pick up their spirits and do something. So this is what we're saying is that sometimes you look at these places, Nepal and India and South Africa and it feels like it's just so distant. It's so far away, but start locally. If you're a photographer, find someone who needs your photography. Is there a shelter, a woman's shelter, any, a homeless shelter where someone is trying to find a job but they don't have any headshots, for example. They have nothing to show a perspective when they want to apply for something online. Perhaps you can do some professional portraits of them. If you love anything, whatever your pet, if you love animals, go find a local animal shelter. Volunteer for there for one, one day a month. Find something locally. There's some simple things that you can do. How many of us shop on Amazon all the time? If you go on Amazon, you go to smile.amazon.com, you can nominate any charity that you want. And as soon as you do that, anytime you use that link, you're just shopping at Amazon as you always do, Amazon takes a portion of their money and a portion of your purchase will go straight to the charity that you've recommended. So for example, of course, we have the Soul Society. That's my charity that I've selected on Amazon. So every time I shop at Amazon, which is pretty much every day, Amazon donates a portion of that sale to the Soul Society. So any charity that you feel passionate about it, do it. That's something small and it doesn't take something as significant as um, bone marrow registry. So giftoflife.org, if you go there, they send you a little kit, you take a little swab of your saliva, and then you're um, in their registry. And if someone, there are certain types of blood cancers that can only be cured with bone marrow, not blood transfusions, bone marrow. So if you're found to be a match, you then have the choice to help this person receive bone marrow and save their life. It means a couple of days of discomfort for you, but it could save someone's life. So little things like that locally. If you want to do something on a grander scale, then we have things like the Soul Society where we'd love your help. We are always helping for more, more um, charities and organizations to help. So it doesn't matter if it's local or grand, just do something. It's, guys, it's really, really important that you actually know where your money is going. I think many of us sometimes get disgruntled when we look at these big charities and where is my money going to go? Is it going to, is it going to basically pay for a, a corporate CEO running it and all that kind of thing? And I, I understand that. And that's why we needed to actually create the charity so we know where our money is going. And, charity, um, and we actually found out there were some problems once you start Googling as to they actually set it up purely to make money. It was all the front. So be careful where your money's going. Now, also, it doesn't even have time. Now, one of our best friends who actually also lives here in Las Vegas, uh, John Michael Cooper, John and Delisa, um, they had an incredible project for the, for the third time this, uh, in, the, in fact, the third time this year, last year, they actually created a project called roadsidefamilies.org, Roadside Families. And the premise was that most photographers do not get photographed. It's one of those things that a plumber has leaky pipes and all the, <laughs> the old adage. And the fact is that he traveled off his own dime, bought an RV, traveled the States, and pledged to photograph 100 photographers' families. And the premise was that he'll photograph the families, he will actually produce a print, give it to the family, but he, there's no payment, but the payment is that you have to pay it forward and photograph another, photogra uh, another photographer's family. So can you imagine the ripple effect of this one selfless act in maybe not a wedding season or portrait season that could make a huge difference. So the fact is, don't be cynical about it. Don't look at the world and say, I can't do anything. If you were in dire straits and someone came up to you and said, the fact is, for those watching, people are watching at home, and I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you are photographers, do something different with your camera. Certainly, you, can, you need to be in a position where you're strong. The old adage of putting the mask on yourself before the person next to you certainly rings true. You must be strong enough to a point where you can help others. But believe us, guys, that we were, several years ago, we uh, had a change of life circumstances, 
and we were at that point where we wanted to help the charity, so we created many workshops that every cent was actually going to go to our charity. So if you please follow us at Jerry Gionis, at Mrs. Gionis, and uh, we'll be releasing some workshops later on this year and the following go to our charity make a difference. So the great thing is you can learn and you can also um, do something really cool. Also, guys, to finish off with our presentation today, I wanted to finish off with basically the mandate. What we really are trying to do, and hopefully it touches you, and hopefully it'll inspire you to make a huge difference to someone in your life. And that is this. We all know that poverty exists, and there are millions of people in the world in need of help. Perhaps it would be easy to dismiss the enormity of the problem as hopeless, or feel overwhelmed by not knowing where to start. But what if you witnessed such poverty with your own two eyes or have experienced it for yourself? Wouldn't that make you responsible? What do you do when ignorance is no longer bliss? And the answer is simple. Help one soul at a time, soul to soul. Thank you so much, guys. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, stick around. In 15 minutes, we're going to have another amazing program by Jen Rosenbaum, a portrait boudoir photographer from New York. And do not forget a special presentation by Captain Scott Kelly, U.S. astronaut that spent a year on the International Space Station. Stick around. we got more great programming com coming right here live at CES. <laughs>